The governor completely ignores Denver's migrant crisis in his State of the State address as new street encampments grow ahead of killer cold this weekend. We framed the items that are of statewide concern, right? I'm not the mayor of Denver. Colorado's top wildlife official is apologizing for how the state handled the release of wolves, while the governor is joking about it. We'll ask him if there's a disconnect. A law meant to expand access to insurance information in different languages has actually had the opposite effect. Um, we wanted more language access, and they are pulling back, which I feel like they're not listening. And a beautiful weekend in the mountains is going to come with the highest risk we've seen all season tonight on Next. The governor's state of state address always lays out priorities and then, by extension, makes pretty clear what the governor does not prioritize. Today, Governor Jared Polis told his fellow Democrats who run the Capitol that they need to focus on housing affordability. And the governor did not say one word about Denver's migrant crisis. Polis wants the legislature to go back after some ideas that have not had enough support in the past, like an overhaul of the state's land use policies to promote more housing density, especially along transit corridors. Polis wants to build on federal funding to create some long promised passenger rail corridors from Fort Collins to Pueblo and up from Denver to Boulder and Longmont. Polis again pushed for income and property tax cuts. That's faced opposition from Democrats who don't want to lower taxes. Cutting the income tax rate isn't a panacea, but to spur continued growth, it should be part, part of any significant progressive reforms to Tabor refund mechanisms. Isn't that great? We got applause from nobody, which means we all agree. And I challenge Democrats and Republicans to work together to improve our economic growth and success by not taking taxes that we can't keep anyway, and instead working on a bold and balanced and progressive package, including cutting the income tax rate. Denver's spiraling migrant crisis did not even receive a passing mention. 4,300 migrants are still in shelters across the city. More are living on the streets. Just a week after the city moved people out of a massive encampment to the indoors, new camps are growing. Our Angeline McCall went there. From one camp to the next, migrants have found a new place to stay. Por los momentos es algo que nos ayuda a nosotros para tener un techo donde dormir, donde descansar. Y todo. Jordan spent time at the camp at Zunai before it was swept. Now he's at this new encampment off of 51st and Emerson. Mi primer noche acá. Y pues no sé hasta cuántas noches, pero acá estamos. This is our gear tent. Advocates helped set this up along with all of the gear they need. I mean, we've taught them how to survive out here. We've given them all of the gear that they need just to get going here. Amy Beck began looking for a new location when the previous encampment at Zunai closed. Just the spirit of the camp right now is very good. People are in good spirits uh, because, that yes, they feel like they have a solution. Ellis has been at the encampment for about one week. She's been in Denver for four months, most of it living like this. Sí, yo tuve, cuando yo llegué me mandaron para un refugio que era el Hotel Comfort. Duré 21 días y ahí me, me fui para Zuni. They already feel this camp is different than the last they stayed at. Más tranquilo, más cómodo. All they hope for now is to be able to stay so that they don't have to move again. Todo lo que se necesita lo tenemos aquí. Gracias a Dios. After we spoke to the migrants at the new camp today, we learned that police officers arrived after we had gotten there. And now that now those that we spoke to are confused, they wonder if they will be swept again or if they'll be allowed to stay. Officers and city workers also visited a different encampment today underneath a bridge at 48th and Fox, highly encouraging people to leave. That was city workers doing that. So they bus them to get to shelter. Now the city is not calling this a sweep, but propane tanks were removed from that camp today too because of safety concerns so even if they wanted to stay, that means that they really couldn't. Denver Human Services says that this was ahead of the cold weather, trying to keep people safe. So even though it technically isn't a sweep, it kind of feels like one. And that's why people at this newest encampment worry that will happen to them next. Not sweeping them necessarily, but in a way also not allowing them to stay. Kyle? Yeah, I mean, it's heartbreaking to see families out there in that situation. I think there's a lot of confusion about where people want to be, where they can be, and then the fact that, I mean, this cold this weekend is no joke. Like, that, that could be killer cold. That's bad news.
so cold. And, you know, everyone wants to deal with the situation differently when it comes to migrants, right? Some of them, they want to stay at the encampment and they kind of want to bear the cold. Others want to take the opportunity to go into shelter. Some of them want to go into a different direction, you know, with friends or family if they have those here. And then on top of that, you know, a lot of people just don't want to bounce around. That's really mm -hmm. uh, why some people don't want to go into the shelter, even when it's offered to them. Angelina McCall, thank you. Our next conversation tonight is with Governor Polis. Almost 7,000 words in his State of the State address, touching on everything from magic mushrooms to black-footed ferrets, from a standout science program in Paonia to getting train service out to Craig, but not a single mention of that migrant crisis engulfing Denver. Denver is currently facing an unprecedented migrant crisis, nearly 36,000 arrivals. Not one word of it in your State of the State. Why? Well, first of all, I focus on the vision for our state. There's, there's pieces we talked about that pertain to that, the biggest one being housing. Um, there's many dimensions to housing, whether it's homelessness, whether it's migrants, whether it's people that have lived here for generations. We need more housing that people can afford in the state of Colorado. The fact that this is such a massive problem for Denver, and it didn't so much as get a mention in your speech, is that an indication that this is Denver's problem, not your problem? Well, I think, first of all, uh, what I tried to do in my speech, and we did, is we framed the items that are of statewide concern, right? I'm not the mayor of Denver. We work with the mayor of Denver. We support the mayor of Denver. The mayor of Denver is there, mayor of Colorado Springs, mayor of Aurora, mayor of Fort Collins. Uh, and, of course, the state wants to help uh, all of our mayors achieve what they need. But the statewide issue we talked about is housing. In the state of Illinois, Governor Pritzker's put like $300 million into the migrant crisis the state is staffing shelters in Chicago. In New York State, $1.8 billion from the state. The National Guard is working shelters there. My understanding is that Colorado has given Denver less than $10 million to address Denver's crisis. Well, first of all, in absolute numbers, to be clear, we have far less people, and per capita, I know it's challenging for us, but we have far less numbers than Chicago or New York, so I wanna make that clear. Uh, and so, again, we're happy to hear what Denver's needs are. We're in very close conversation with them. I, I don't think there's any daylight between us. Um, and we really want to keep the focus on the federal government, where it belongs, the only entity that can remedy this, the only entity that secure our borders, the only entity that can give work permits, the only entity that can and should uh, pay for uh, areas where they fail to act. Uh, we asked the Denver mayor's office for its reaction to the migrant crisis being ignored in the State of the State address. They sent us a statement saying that they are in regular communication with the governor about what they call Denver's most urgent matter. And they wrote, we know that the state succeeds when Denver succeeds. And we hope the state continues to support our work and advocate for our community. Now, the migrant crisis was not mentioned in the state of state, but the wolves were. In a moment, we're going to ask the governor if there's a disconnect between him joking about wolf reintroduction while his head of Parks and Wildlife is out there this week apologizing for the way that they handled it. A lot of people are gonna be headed to the hills for this holiday weekend. You gotta be careful, because avalanche experts say the slopes are primed to slide. Avalanche advisories and warnings paint the map of nearly all of Colorado's mountain ranges in considerable to high avalanche danger. Avalanche Information Center says it is the highest avalanche risk we have faced all winter, and it's riskiest in the backcountry. As always, the expert advice is the same. Check the avalanche forecast before you go into the backcountry, and take along avalanche rescue equipment. Lauren Robinson, I mean, it's, it's no joke up there this weekend, and it's gonna be a crowded weekend, so there's gonna be people who say, I don't wanna go to the ski areas, I'm gonna pop somewhere in the backcountry. Yeah, that's really not the greatest thing to do because we did get a lot of snow in a short amount of time and that's what creates those avalanche dangers. And we're going to continue to see more snow as we move through the next few days. So I would expect those avalanche dangers would do nothing but increase. Now, we're also going to see temperatures decrease by quite a bit. Right now, we're at 8 degrees at DIA. Most of the front range in eastern plains in the single digits and teens. Same goes for the high country. But once you factor in those gusty winds we've been seeing all afternoon across the eastern half, of the state coming in at 20, 30, 40 miles per hour at times. That makes it feel a lot colder. So with these winds pushing in, it feels like three degrees below zero outside in Denver. Most of the front range in eastern plains feels like sub zero temperatures. And you'll notice oh, as we go through the weekend, the front range in eastern plains are going to be a lot colder than what we're seeing in the high country. But that doesn't negate that avalanche danger. If you are planning those backcountry trips, just nix them for the weekend. We have lots of wind chill alerts across 
across uh, the Front Range and Eastern Plains as we go through the next several days. Roughly what those are saying is that wind chill values could drop to negative 20 to negative 30 degrees. So make sure you're bundled up because exposed skin could get frostbite in a matter of minutes and make sure you bring those pets inside. As for the snow in the high country, central and northern portions will be under winter storm warnings through Saturday evening. Areas that got nearly a foot of snow already are expecting another foot or more as we go into the next few days. So because of that, the couple of areas where we have the highest avalanche danger, where we have avalanche warnings through Monday, this is going to be near Steamboat Springs, near Crested Butte, level four out of five. Again, stay out of those backcountry areas. We are going to continue to monitor snow that's falling to the south. That'll eventually move out late overnight. We're going to see those lows pretty chilly in the single digits. It's going to feel closer to the uh, it's going to feel closer to zero degrees overnight tomorrow. Temperatures make it into the 30s, but wind chills with gusty winds at around 40 miles per hour going to feel closer to the teens. Lauren, thank you. The latest Republican to get into the race for the seat that Congresswoman Lauren Boebert is leaving has some pretty unique bipartisan credentials. He's changed parties. 18 times. Stephen Relic currently sits on the Colorado Board of Education. He was appointed there. He's a combat vet who describes himself as a battle-tested conservative. Before that, he was a battle-tested Democrat. Since 2011, Varela has been registered as a Republican, then a Democrat, then unaffiliated, then Republican again, then Democrat, then Republican, then Democrat. Hold up, we're just getting started. Then he became a Republican again, then Democrat, then Republican, then Democrat, then Republican, then Democrat, then Republican. Wild, right? We're still not done. He then switched to unaffiliated and then Democrat and then Republican again. I don't know if my favorite is when he switched twice in one day or when Varela switched from Republican to Democrat three days before a presidential election, then did not bother to vote. Last year, I asked him about this and he said, quote, Holy cow, so bizarre, right? I think um, what we need to do a better job on is managing uh, the very real conflicts that Wolf presents, particularly around ranchers um, in our ranching communities. As the governor being serious about the Wolf issue, he's also been joking about it a lot, so we'll ask him, is this a joking matter? And insurance providers, given the cold shoulder to non-English speakers, all because of a law that's intended to expand access to insurance. That's next. The head of Colorado Parks and Wildlife is apologizing again and again for how they handled the recent release of 10 gray wolves west of the divide. Locals and even CPW commissioners didn't get a heads up. I apologize to all of you um, for the, the notification and, and the transparency pieces. I recognized it when it was going on what the impact was going to be, but it, it was doubled, tripled, and quadrupled down on <laughs> as uh, the days kind of played out. CBW Director Jeff Davis apologizing to the Parks and Wildlife Commission there. He also apologized to members of the state legislature. CBW says by most measures, the release of these wolves in Grand and Summit counties last month was a success. The wolves are all still healthy. There have not been any reports of wolves attacking livestock, but the head of CBW says he quote unquote dropped the ball because he didn't notify key communities, including nearby ranchers, before they turned the wolves loose. Governor Polis has celebrated the release of the wolves, and he's also been making jokes about it on social media, like it's an advertisement for the state. That's where we return to our conversation with the governor. You've been joking around about it on social media. Colorado now with wolves. That's what I do, not unique to wolves. I, I no, I, under, I understand. Yeah, I mean, you yeah. joke around about a lot of stuff, but including yeah. wolves. Meanwhile, your Parks and Wildlife Director is out there apologizing to CBW commissioners, apologizing to the legislature for a lack of transparency and communication about so, how yeah. this was handled. It, so, so here's my question yeah. for you. Are you sorry about how it went? No, look, I think um, it's, it, it was very hard. The, the, the task the voters gave to Colorado Parks and Wildlife, the voters said, introduce wolves by December 31st of last year, uh, which effectively left about a three week window to actually introduce wolves, legal actions, 10J, uh, lots of paperwork around wolves. So at the end of the day, CPW had three weeks to comply with the law. Um, I don't think it would have been feasible for them to give a specific heads up where and when to dozens of people. So I, I, I think um, what we need to do a better job on is managing 
uh, the very real conflicts that Wolf presents, particularly around ranchers um, and our ranching communities. And we're, as an administration, deeply dedicated to doing that. Given that it's something that Coloradans think could impact their livelihoods, is it something you're going to keep joking around about? Well, I have a, uh, I hope you think, a good sense of humor. I like to have a lively social media feed, both on my personal as well as my um, uh, a professional governor of Colorado account. And I think what you see generally through what we do is we try to uplift and find joy and humor. And My full 10 minute conversation with the governor is up on the next YouTube channel. There we also talk about efforts to keep peace at the Capitol these days after there were resignations over a toxic work environment. It really has de I mean, a devastating effect, we think, both on insurance consumers and agents. So the hope was to get insurance information to Coloradans who use languages other than English. And what actually happened was the exact opposite. A new law requires Colorado's insurance companies to provide policy documents in any language that they advertise in. So ask for customers in Spanish. You got to provide insurance info in Spanish. That way everybody knows what's up. Argelisa Arizari shows us the unintended consequences that followed. A January day in Aurora brings that bitter cold, the kind of chill that catches some by surprise. But lately, the weather isn't the only thing changing. So it's really, really affected my business and how we can operate on a daily basis. Martin Amador is an Allstate agency owner. He, like so many others, uh, I was shocked. We're stunned to learn about House Bill 1004. The new law requires insurance companies to advertise in the language their policies are available in. If an agent advertises in Spanish, their policies should be in Espanol. I have a, a staff of uh, six Spanish speakers. They trust us, especially when you're speaking in their native language. For Amador and other Allstate agents, the new law changed everything. Allstate sent out a directive to comply with this new bill, stating agents were now only authorized to advertise, quote, or sell policies in English. It really has de I mean, a devastating effect, we think, both on insurance consumers and agents. Carol Walker is the executive director of the Rocky Mountain Insurance Association. She's been fielding calls about this new bill's text. There is a lot of uncertainty in this foreign language bill that will lead to litigation. Insurance companies are estimating two to four years to be able to comply with all this documentation. But this is all the opposite of what the bill sponsor wanted. Yes, 100%. State Representative Elizabeth Velasco supported this bill to help non-English speakers better understand their policies. She does want to make changes so that the bill does what it needs to. We can get there through making clarifications. Uh, we can do that. Changes in this part of town will be a warm welcome. I really want to be able to help the people that are in need. Both Representative Velasco and the Rocky Mountain Insurance Association say this is not over. They are meeting again to clarify some of the details and try to figure out the best way to implement these changes. Allstate Corporate tells us they want to support everyone in the language of their choice, but this legislation prevents that. They say they're working with their industry partners to find a solution. What a mess. Glad you're bringing it to light. Julie Sarazari, thank you. Your feedback on what you heard from the governor here next. Your feedback on what you heard from the governor on this program tonight. Keith writes in to say A plus to Polis on wanting to cut taxes. Keith writes, that is an intelligent move on his part. It's going to be complicated. The legislature will see what happens. Mary Lee says, good job asking Polis about the migrants. Denver is in his state. It's a shocker to me when it didn't come up, not even in one sentence with the Denver mayor sitting right there in front of him. And Worcester writes, thank you for your interview with the governor. Appreciate your concern about the wolves. Worcester writes, it is not a joking matter. It just seemed like a real disconnect. Like you've got the governor who does joke about a lot of things, joking about the wolves. Colorado now with wolves says his graphic while his CPW director is out there hat in hand apologizing to people left and right about how they handled it. Seems like it's kind of one or the other. Thanks for your feedback. We'll see you next time.